Okay, guys, welcome again for this uh, session today. We move on to Thermalink part two, episode three of XC series. And yeah, since we can't fly, the next best thing is talk about flying. And uh, yeah, if it can be a learning experience, then even better. So, okay, let's uh, resume from where we left uh, the part one. Uh, we go back to the slides, see where we are. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we start with the exercises. Uh, Seth, you can remove the slide for a bit. So, yeah, so we'll talk about, you know, like what exercises you can do to, you know, uh, master uh, thermaling. So first thing, you know, a little bit of a revision that uh, let this be really clear that, you know, make your progression step by step. Uh, if you jump the gun and try to do something too early, uh, it's only gonna delay your progress. So uh, like we mentioned, you know, in the previous uh, episode that uh, it should be a step by step progression. Remember the pyramid, it's got to be really nice and solid at the base. And uh, to begin, uh, we keep talking about it again and again. You've seen like, you know, top names in the industry come and talk. Uh, nothing will prepare you better than ground handling. With ground handling, uh, you really connect to your glider. You connect to the glider behavior and you develop, you know, your uh, muscle memory to be in sync with your glider. And once you are, you know, begin to be one with your glider, uh that's when uh you know it can start to become enjoyable or uh, your mind becomes free to start attending to you know concepts of you know mapping concepts of you know uh, centering and then you know the centering adjustments otherwise if you're still busy you know with, with trying to like you know uh, handle your glider uh, then it can be a big mess and you may have read a lot but uh, it doesn't make sense and you don't progress so number one, like, you know, solid ground handling, especially when we start now, uh, pick your wing and uh, go ground handle, ground handle, ground handle. I think they should be very clear. So, so that's one. And uh, second, uh, we talked about uh, uh, active piloting, which uh, you can work on while ground handling as well. You get direct benefit. And second is, you know, flying in, if you've done your 20 day courses, you're, you're a 10 day, 10 hour, 20 hour, 30 hour, 50 hour pilot, then flying in slightly uh, tougher conditions, little turbulent conditions, and then practice your, you know, turns. So uh, that's, that's uh, kind of uh, backing before we, you know, recommend exercises to you. So coming back to the slide, first thing which you can practice are these, you know, uh, the optimal turn, you know, we need to really be able to do uh, tight uh, 360s and uh, smooth 360s. So I hope uh, most of you've read uh, Kelly's book. Uh, he talks about this optimal uh, radius of a turn, which uh, comes to around 16 seconds, which ideally would, you know, fit in uh, most thermals. Uh, you wanna go tighter, you go to like, you know, 14, 12 seconds, and in a big thermal, maybe a gaggle, maybe you're going to 15, 14 seconds also. So you need to really get comfortable with the 16 second turns. You need to be comfortable to be able to vary your bank angle inside the turn and be able to uh, control your speed. So what we do, we initiate a turn, we got our you know, weight shifted. So the weight shift stays always because you only will be turning on one side. So that can be pretty much fixed to a great extent. Number one. Number two, you have the inside brake, which also, you know, is quite fixed. You don't wanna be changing it too much. And then you have the outside, you know, which kind of controls your speed and you do the finer corrections with it. And get really familiar, you know, playing with the, uh, uh, your bank angle in doing, practicing these 360 degree turns. And like we mentioned before, 
uh, have to practice uh, both the sides because you don't know, you know, you go into a thermal, it could be a left hand, it could be a right hand, and you shouldn't have preference. If you have a preference, that means we need to switch over and practice on the other side. You should be totally neutral in terms of your, you know, uh, skill level in turning left or right. So, so this is one uh, exercise which will go a long, long, long way. Uh, it's at the base of the pyramid and you go a long way in improving your thumbling skills. Second is pitch control. Um, we talk a lot about this, you know, during a 20 day course in a basic SIV, in advanced SIV. This is uh, one of the key uh, learnings in a, in a SIV as well. And you will realize, uh, we're gonna show you a video as well, uh, that the glider pitches a lot, especially when you begin thermaling. Uh, most of you here, you know, are aware when you started to, you know, thermal, how much uh, of pitch happens. Now, uh, controlling the pitch, how fast you can control the pitch uh, matters. You know, timely inputs, if you are attentive and aware and you can sense, you need a very small input. If you uh, react late, you need a bigger input. If you react even later, you need a much more, you know, input to, you know, control that pitch. So you need to really crack pitches and uh, uh, be really like, you know, really adapted to this, this particular skill. Uh, we, we teach you this in, in the 20 day course, we teach you in basic SIV, we teach you in you know, advanced SIV and uh, you need to know this really well. We'll uh, uh, have a look at a video now and see, you know, like if, if you're not good with this, uh, what, what, what you can expect to happen. Not a very good control takeoff. Uh, glider pitches up, no control, glider dives forward, no checking, asymmetric, uh, glider turns, diving, no checking, glider's gonna pitch up again, massive pitch there, nothing. Now, first time we see some brakes applied, bit of a control, glider pitches up again. You see a bit of a break there, and first time you see kind of little bit of a control, you know. So, whoa, you know, like, uh, you can expect this to happen if you, you know, don't have your pitch uh, really controlled. We have a question from Pratik. Pratik, please go ahead. We can remove the slide. Um, Avi, a quick question regarding pitch control that I had was, so yeah. when my glider pitches back, I do my hands up. Now, to give the check, should I wait for the glider to come exactly in front or when I feel it's exactly overhead, I stop it there? Uh, very good question because uh, it makes a big difference. So if you apply the brake while it is coming overhead, you know, you'll make the glider dive even more. Okay. Okay. And this is what we teach you in SIV actually. And it's a very important point. Okay. And we can go into the aerodynamics of it, you know, in some other session. But somehow you energize the glider. If you apply a little bit of brake now and release, the glider will even dive more. Okay. So you let the glider dive, you let it go forward. Okay. And now you apply brakes. How much brakes you apply? You apply the brakes till the time glider stops moving. The moment it stops moving, you release. The resultant right. will be you will come underneath and the glider you'll find is exactly overhead. Okay. So, so how much to how much to apply, when to apply, very important. So, glider dives, you see it crossing overhead. Now you apply your uh, how fast or slow depending on the speed of the glider. It goes really fast. You go fast. Okay. Okay. Your your objective is to stop the glider from going forward. So okay. it's going really fast. You apply fast, and the moment it stops, boom, the job is done. You release, and you come underneath and the glider is stable. Okay, so just a quick question. We don't have to yep. wait for the glider to reach the farthest point of his dive to stop the dive. It can be at, uh, as soon as as soon as I see it going, overshooting my head. It overshoots forward and you can stop. Okay. So when you're thermaling, you sometimes need very little and it's going slowly. You need a very slow input as well and a small one. 
Sometimes when it's a, when you're thrown out of a core, which is at the edge of the thermal, it can go boom really fast. And you can need to apply maybe 60%, 80% breaks really fast. It stops, you release, papa, and you come underneath. Okay, so you need to let it pass. So not over, you let it pass and you check, release. And that's what we teach you. Uh, we make you practice by yourself and you really need to have this skill. Right. So a must uh, exercise to practice, practice, to, to be good at this. Fine? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Hey, cool. Avi, can yeah. I just quickly add about the amplitude of the check that we do? Because yes. it's very easy to tell the new guys that, uh, yeah, you, you check as much as it goes. But how do I know as a new guy how much it goes? Right. So for me, the way I have learned over the time is initially when the wing shoots, you apply a certain level of check and, you know, the especially ENDs are not that crazy. So if you apply a little bit of first check, the wing will stop and then you start, let's say, releasing a bit. But you see there's another dive that's happening. Then you again do a check. So you can even go a little bit one or two if required, as required. Basically, keep giving that check till the point it stops going forward. The moment it stops going forward, then you can start releasing. But if you don't know in the initial days how much that is, because it takes time to know the acceleration, depending on acceleration, how much break I'm going to add, till all that equation comes in your head as a muscle memory, you'll have to do maybe multiple jabs. And that's what I've seen sometimes in my initial days, I would do like one check, it will stop, then I'll try to release, it will again dive, then I'll give another check, just as a, you know, learning steps along the way. Okay, so just to add to that, uh, you're applying in order to stop the glider. Okay, reference, I don't know how many people notice this, but this is the horizon. horizon. And you have your glider, you know, moving forward like this. Okay, so this, this gap between the glider and the horizon is reducing. And when it stops, uh, when you apply brakes to stop it, this, this gap doesn't reduce anymore. That means the glider has stopped moving forward now. Okay, now you release and you get back to normal flight. So if you are really looking, uh, you can also clearly see this. You see the horizon and the glider going forward and this gap between the horizon and your glider are reducing. And if you applied brake, the this gap will uh, stop uh, to reduce. That's the time to release. It can be an additional reference. Okay. Avi, I want to add one point for Pratik. Yeah. So he said that, uh, Pratik, you said that you were waiting for the glider to come to the highest point of the dive before you break. There's no point to break after that because if it's going to come this much energy, it's going to come in front of you. There's no need to check because it's going to stop. But what if it goes below that? It's too late for you to stop anyways. So the idea is not to let it go in front at all. It, you, you check as fast as possible before it goes in front. The whole idea is not to let it go. Down. So that's not the right way to think. To start and stop as soon as possible. So if you've, if you've forgotten and you're late, it's okay. You apply whenever you notice it and just stop it because it's gonna, it needs to go really forward like to 50, 60 degrees, you know, before to get a collapse. And even if you get a collapse, you know, you will swing underneath and it will smack open immediately. Okay, so it's not a very dangerous thing. So in case also you get into a situation where you've totally missed it and you've done nothing about it and the glider has passed the stage where it's now gonna do a frontal, it is not so bad. Because you're gonna go underneath, and you'll, you know, uh, it'll, it'll, the, the weight will make it open. Okay, but yeah, I mean, this we need to do in, you know, basic SIV and practice it, practice it, and this, this is a, a key, key skill. Okay, we, we need to get this. So next right. is. <clears throat> so sorry, Avi, there is a question on the chat. Gliders yeah. like CNA are a bit slow to achieve faster turns. That's from Kester. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> yes, they are. So, you know, uh, we compensate that by using, you know, weight shift. If we want a tighter turn, we use more weight shift. And we also, you know, ease up on the outside brake and we can achieve, you know, quite a steep angle of turn. Yeah. And uh, again, you know, practice this. Like you're in a turn, I want to increase my bank angle, ease up on the outside, 
give a wee bit inside and you can really turn time. You can spiral, you can do anything with the ENAs, no problem. And uh, we will uh, make you practice that, okay? We do this progressively, you know? You fly at a certain bank angle and speed and then slightly more and then reduce. And then you, you know, when you get some kind of competence, then you start to play inside. You make it tight, you make it loose, you make it tight, you make it loose, and you can play with the glider on the horizon. Yeah. Have I answered you, Kaiser? Okay. Uh, third is, you know, practicing. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I got my answer. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. So third is, you know, progressive and dynamic exit of 360. Uh, again, you know, like uh, this is basically, uh, this will help you a lot in terms of understanding the energy of your glider. And uh, not only understanding the energy of your glider, but being able to control, you know, the energy of your glider, because this uh, will be, you know, in demand uh, so many times and in so many situations while uh, thermally. So, uh, uh, we've written in the brackets, respect the axis, which means, you know, you select a point, you know, on the horizon somewhere, uh, do a tight 360 uh, or to whatever degree you are, you know, you practiced and then progressively exit, respecting the axis that you should roll out exactly into the point you have chosen and see sometimes that you're not able to, you know, because you have not judged uh, the energy of the glider and uh, you overshot. Your timing is not too late, or sometimes the timing is early, and uh, sometimes uh, you know you've you you you've done it in the sense that there's there's a lot of pitch in your glider. Uh, so now you begin to really understand the energy of the glider and how your inputs uh, are lagging behind or you are quick. Uh, all this you know will become clear when you uh, do this particular exercise, uh, marking a place. Uh, marking an axis and then practicing progressive exits and dynamic exits. By progressive exits, we mean that you start to ease out of the turn, you take the weight off, you ease off the brakes, and you control the energy that when you roll out, you are exactly in the direction you want to roll out and your glider is not pitching. This means, wow, you have good control. And you do this on the left side, you do it consecutively, and you know that, okay you know, I got it now. You know, I can roll out in the direction I want with full control of the energy of my glider. And then, you know, do dynamic exits also just to understand, you know, the energy of the glider. So uh, you're turning pretty tight and then you suddenly release, but in the right axis and you see how the glider, glider speed uh, starts to convert the speed energy into a climb energy. So the glider will start to climb. It has no choice. And it'll start to climb, it'll start to pitch back. You are aware, uh, I need to ease up on the brakes. Angle of attack is really high. And then you wait for it to, you know, come before you can decide to initiate a turn. And uh, we'll come to, you know, the accidents a little later. But if you don't understand this energy, that's when, you know, we have, you know, common mistakes in thermaling, like uh, people, uh, the glider is pitching back. They want to turn immediately because, you know, they got get a sense of lift and they spin the glider. Uh, we'll talk about it a little later as well. So we need to understand that uh, uh, the stalling angle of attack has gone really high. Uh, it depends on the loading of the glider, not the position of the brake. So, so this particular exercise, progressive and dynamic exit of 360s, respecting the axis, will really go a long way, you know, to... Uh, uh, get you, you know, control of the energy of the glider. So I think let's have a look. This is a pitch exercise. So it's a, so uh, have a close look, you know, when to check it, glider goes forward. Now you check it stops, you release, and the glider is overhead. We'll, I think, now see a progressive exit. Watch. 
it's gone in nice and tight and rolls out. Clara pitches back, checks it in time, and it's overhead. So this exercise, you need to, you know, practice a lot. This will really, you know, make you uh, understand your glider behavior and your energy of your glider and uh, how to control that energy perfectly. And then use it, you know, when it's demanded. This is more of a dynamic exit, you'll notice. So it goes in tight. And then you see the dive, huge dive, yeah? and then checks and good control. So, so yeah, I mean, you need to, you know, first learn them with your instructors uh, in, in your progression exercises or a basic SIV or a advanced SIV, and then practice, practice, practice. You really need to uh, uh, crack this one and really good, get good with this to uh, get a good sense of control. And then uh, you are way better off, you know, to control the energy of your glider in a summer. Okay, next. So, so let's say, you know, you got a bit of a hang now. Uh, you're able to uh, stay in a thermal. Okay, you're able to uh, stay inside the thermal. Uh, you may get out for a bit, but you can sense it and you know, uh, you've got some skills to uh, stay inside the thermal and you're beginning to kind of get the sense as to which part of my turn is, you know, a little stronger. Uh, and then you can begin to, you know, start to map uh, the thermal in your mind and then begin to, you know, start centering towards stronger lift. But once you get a little adept at that, then uh, this is the exercise that, you know, uh, goes a long way in uh, making you understand uh, thermaling better and uh, polishing your skills. So you go inside the thermal, you top it, you reach the top. And then like, you know, we discussed last time as well, uh, get out of it, just float around, relax yourself, uh, enjoy the scenery uh, because uh, you need to really concentrate when you're in a thermal and concentration really takes energy away. Uh, we can only, you know, as humans, concentrate for about 20 minutes in one hour. So you, it's, it's quite intense because you're sensing and you're you know, keeping your glider stable and steady, doing active piloting, uh, sensing the thermal and trying to core it, it's gonna take quite a lot of juice out of you. So we reach the top and then we just you know, float around, relax, look around the sky, enjoy the beauty around us, uh, come low about 200 feet higher than the base from where it starts and then you enter it again and then practice going back up again and then out again. And this you can keep doing as long as you, you know, enjoy it. So this will not only you know, improve your thermaling skills, but also your stamina. And uh, yeah, this is uh, the top exercise you can do to master your thermaling. Once you get good with that, uh, like we do in our thermaling courses, next is thermal to thermal transitions on 30 to 50% speed bar. So like we do, you know, uh, in beef, we climb in the house thermal. Once we get a good altitude, we start heading towards plus one. Uh, and we teach you, you know, the techniques for transitions, uh, where to aim your glider, where do you expect the next thermal to be? And then start getting familiar with using your speed bar and uh, flying your glider. Uh, as smooth as possible to get the best, you know, glide uh, ratio. Uh, once you reach there again, it's the same game on. Uh, you enter the thermal and then, you know, thermal in, uh, do your best. And then once you reach the top, maybe you can come back or get out, go down, enter it again. And this, this is the best way. So, so people get excited, you know, they get a bit of, you know, experience of thermaling and then They've heard about you know cross country and they want to go cross country, and you know on the third region they're bombing out and they have to land somewhere, and stuff like this. So it doesn't make sense you know to start traveling unless you get really good with thermaling. So once you master thermaling, traveling becomes easy. So, so yeah. Uh, next one, uh, flying with weak thermals, uh, flying with weak thermals and without radio in strong thermals. So 
if uh, you've gone slightly, you know, prematurely with thermaling, uh, maybe uh, first going to weaker thermals where they are not very demanding, they are not very turbulent, and uh, they'll develop your sense and the feel much more than going into thermals where it's very easy to climb. Any idiot goes in, does a turn, he'll be lifted. Uh, that's not thermaling. So if you really want to, you know, uh, improve your skills, weak thermals are the key. So in the mornings and then, you know, late evenings. And these are the, you know, uh, thermals, the weak thermals that will really build your, you know, finer uh, thermaling muscles when uh, you really have to uh, give very fine kind of inputs uh, and you develop your senses also, you know, much more. So most top pilots you'll see like, you know, they'll take off really early and test their skills in weak thermals early in the morning and uh, then test your skills like later in the evening as well. So if you want to get good with your thermaling, go for weak thermals whenever you get a chance. Uh, practice in the morning thermals and the evening thermals. So, so in thermals, you need, you know, uh, the tools from uh, being like, you know, super subtle with the super subtle where, you know, you're giving like, you know, inputs of millimeters. And sometimes it's like zero, zero, you're neither climbing, you're neither descending. And uh, it's beautiful. And you're just like, sometimes not even, you don't want to breathe because, you know, maybe it, you lose it. It, it. it becomes like so fine, you know, where just a, just a wee bit of a movement will, you know, make a difference to you. So from that fine and super subtle flying to sometimes being, you know, thrown in a washing machine and having to, you know, like aggressively give inputs. So we have to kind of, you know, mirror what's happening in thermals. Uh, be ready, you know, when it's subtle, you are subtle. And when it's like, you know, full on, you are also, you know, uh, aggressively giving responsible responses wherever, you know, required. So this range uh, of skills we need. Uh, and you really build your, you know, sensibilities, you know, senses when you, you know, practice in weak thermals. So that's the key you know, to really develop your real flying skills. But that's the difference between pilots who are still flying and others who have landed. So, so you know, let's say six pilots go and, you know, it's super weak. It's a zero, zero thermal or even minus, you know, minus 0.5. Uh, that will decide, you know, who will stay up and who will not. In, in easy thermals, you know, in beer, you will hear people with like 10, 15 hours or 20 hours, you know, happen to be, you know, up in the air on that day. It was super strong. In fact, they didn't have the skills to come down. So they pointed the glider towards Dharamsala and then they pointed the glider, you know, back and they did 100 kilometers. Per, but do you have really the skills, you know? Uh, so, so to really develop the skills, uh, uh, peak thermals really go a long way. And... Uh, once you've, you know, worked your way up the pyramid, and then, you know, the, the strong ones uh, become easy for you. So, so also, uh, to then not supremely start depending on, you know, uh, uh, the instruments. So it's a good idea, you know, there's nobody around and, you know, not too much traffic. Uh, you're okay, you put off your vario and now feel. Because you want to give feel uh, the priority. There's a lag, there's a delay and the instrument can uh, fool you also. So, so when it comes to, you know, that uh, uh, decision to, you know, if you turn now, it's okay. If you turn now, it's not okay. Uh, so the guy who has the feel, you know, will, you know, get the timing right. But if you're totally depending on the instrument, you will be off, you know, when it comes to it. So, so uh, you need to practice, you know, with it off as well. Uh, make it a point that after enjoying, you know, with the instrument, uh, you put it off and then enjoy, you know, without it. Because ultimately, when you become a master, you will want, you know, like, uh, uh, instrument is off, and you go to the Ramsala and back, and like, my God, woohoo, that's the top level. So, yeah, I think we have some questions, Sach. So Prashant, uh, go ahead with your question. Okay, hi, Avi. So, yeah, I have a question. So when we were taught uh, the basics of gliding or paragliding, you were taught that when you start a turn, you bank body shift into the turn. But then I remember Mr. Gunpur telling us that in probably in a weaker thermal, 
when you want to turn left you back, you put your body weight to the right and give a little bit of left one to keep it turn as flat as possible to get the maximum amount of lift out of it so uh, yes yes you know uh, i use this technique as well and uh, you know like i said before uh, once you reach a certain level of uh, competence uh, you and in your practice you start to you know uh, experiment and all that. so uh, the 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 concept is that you know you want to keep your glider as flat as possible in the turn so flat you are uh, more surface area is exposed to the lifting air vis-a-vis -vis a bent uh, glider with a surface area exposed to the lifting air is less so you want to keep it flat so so you want to throw your weight on the outside and use a lot of inner brake and also the outer brake and you're keeping it as flat as possible. And just to share with you, you know, like there are times when uh, uh, I am like, you know, doing this and my weight is all on the opposite side of the turn. I've got a lot of brake here and then I'm pumping it like this, you know, and I'm spinning my glider. If the, if the thermal is just my glider length and not more, so I'm just pumping it and, you know, I'm turning the glider on one wing tip. So basically doing so very flat, quick turns. Took, 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 very flat, quick turns I'm doing. Right. And uh, sometimes I, I take it to a point of, you know, like uh, the stalling angle. And sometimes I give a little extra and I see a helicopter happening in my XC wing. Okay. And then I say, okay, I've gone into a helicopter. I'm like in the axis of the core, just helicoptering like this. But not that I want to helicopter at that time. And I give a little bit of speed and then I'm back in, you know, doing it and shifting it like this. So, but, but to be able to do this, you know, you need to really know your stuff. Uh, you need to know your stall point really well. You need to know your spin point. And then you, you want to take it to the extreme, you know, you want to squeeze out maximum. You want to get optimum kind of, you know, uh, juice out of that particular core. So, so you can play around like this. It's a sport, like, you know, how people dribble in football. Everybody has their own unique style. You will develop that yourself. And you will find, because I, I got to know later that other people are also doing this. I found myself like, you know, doing this myself. You, you'll also find, you know, you're doing stuff uh, yourself. You, because it's a matter of practice. Practice, practice, practice. And then it starts to become intuitive. It starts to become intuitive and it starts to become automatic. And you'll find yourself, you know, doing the right things. Got it. Understood. Clear. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Uh, Pratik. So, uh, Avi, my question is regarding uh, flying with radio on and off. Now, uh, I think in the last session you mentioned that our body can only sense the lift intermittently only when we enter the thermal. After that, we lose a sense of the lifting air. Now, in that case, is our horizon or uh, a surrounding topology only reference point that we have, whether we are gaining height or losing height? Or is there anything else that people look out towards to know that whether they have actually uh, left the thermal or they're not gaining height or they are gaining height? So, yeah, I mean, uh, terrain is the best uh, means, you know. Uh, so while you're turning, you know, from the corner of your eyes, you're looking at the terrain, whether the terrain is going, you know, uh, away from me or, you know, it's coming close. So that tells you your altitude. Uh, higher up, yeah, it's a little bit challenging, but... Uh, if you have, if you have, you know, uh, felt the surge and you entered and you're flying, you're waiting, you've not felt a sink yet. You've not felt any change. So pretty much, you know, you're in the lift still. And thermals are not like, you know, it's very rare that, you know, that it's very smooth and you can't sense it, but there are bubbles like we saw in the, in the, in the picture last time. Uh, and there are, you know, surges, and there are spikes, you know, and there's a core coming and it'll, you, you, you get enough and more feeling to sense what is going in the air. And that's what we want to develop, you know? And we want the body to sense all these movements, you know, by the seat of the pants. We want the body to sense it and respond. So again, coming back to a very valid point, uh, you come out of the thermal, you need to relax. It's so important to totally uh, relax yourself, ease off the body, because if you're not relaxed, you can't feel, okay? So, so a tired body cannot feel, a tensed body cannot feel. And so you're not developing the right, uh, you know, feel for 
for, for, for the thermals. So you need to be really relaxed. The body needs to be relaxed. You need to be relaxed to really feel. And that's how you develop your feel. That is why we want that you first master your thermally. Go on top, get out, float around, enjoy the view, bum, 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 relax the body, shake your legs, and then, okay, enter again, play the game. Bum, 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 full concentration, and then you know out again. Uh, so you need to manage like this. You need to manage your energy levels. And uh, yeah, it's obvious. Like if you're not relaxed, you can't feel. Okay, cool. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, these are some of the exercises that uh, can go, of course, a long way to uh, master thermaling techniques. Uh, uh, we go back to the slides. Okay. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, just remove the slide for a sec, Satch. So, um, so when you are, you know, just a little bit about a uh, uh, few things that, you know, we needed to, you know, uh, mention in continuation. Uh, one is that, you know, we're talking about thermaling, but we yet to add the element of wind in it. Okay. We showed you the diagram. Okay. That is not a, a perfect circle uh, as we can draw on a piece of paper or in, you know, in the books but it's something that is uh, getting affected by, by the wind, okay? So mostly uh, the thermal uh, will be affected uh, by the wind. So what's happening is that we have a strong core, okay, which is the strongest part of the thermal, and we have weaker lift around it, okay? There can be two cores or whatever. And if we have wind blowing this way, it will blow, you know, the weaker wind to the back. Okay, so then instead of the core in the center, uh, it starts to move uh, upwind. Okay, and the weaker wind gets pushed towards the tail, so to say. Okay, also the second factor is that the wind, there's a vertical movement of air here in the thermal, and the air that wind that is blowing like this, the meteor wind, is also going to climb. Okay, that's how pilots can, you know, like soar in front of clouds. Okay, so, so there is ascending air. So these are the two reasons why we want to, you know, shift upwind. So as we get a little better with our thermaling, we start to be aware of the wind direction. Okay, we need to kind of add this into our, you know, our factoring. So one is your instrument will tell you which way the wind is blowing. Uh, when you get the you know lowest uh, ground speed, you know the wind is coming from there. Or the ground features also can tell you you know which way the wind is blowing. So when we are turning, we want to open uh, in the headwind for a bit and then turn again. So we are moving our circles towards towards uh, the core, which is also towards you know uh, the wind. So we are going upwind into stronger lift. So we need to factor this in, uh, very, very important. If we fall out of a thermal, if the wind is blowing like this, if we fall out, it is better we fall out upwind of the thermal because there is ascending air there, okay? Uh, and it's easily we can come back and we are directly, we can hit the core as well. So there's an added advantage like that, but if we, fall out on the tail of the thermal, then we also encounter, you know, rotors because it's like a tree, you know, like, and, and the wind, there's, there's vertical shear, and then there are rotors behind the thermal as well. If it's strong, stronger will be the rotors. And if you fall out in the, in the lee, then we encounter a lot of turbulence, and then there's a problem to re-enter as well. We'll talk about this a little later as well. It's called the prisoner effect. So, we need to kind of, you know, factor this in slowly after a bit of, uh, you know, getting good with this. Uh, this is uh, very essential that we know which way the wind is blowing to help us uh, map the thermal and also, you know, help us in a centering. Also, uh, the centering adjustments, you know, like we talked, uh, we are, you know, in a turn, it's nice and tight. 
and then suddenly boom we get okay something just lifts us like this it's, it's, it's a surge or a spike you know um, pretty good just uh, go into it make your turn tighter so moment you feel a surge uh, tighten the turn and use the surges the surges passes goes back go back to your uh, normal uh, bank angle uh, you will experience this and sometimes like shabad had asked uh, yesterday it can be on the outside as well okay so uh, if it happens on the outside that okay you know something pushes me i can be pushed away like i'm being thrown out so which clearly means that you know maybe there's something stronger here and it's like a fountain and i'm on the edge and i'm being pushed so then we have two options if we are in a turn we continue do a 270 enter it again and if you are super sure and it's not a very tight turn i can you know enter it this way as well so these constant adjustments for centering go on but we have to remember that it should be minimal okay uh, too much inputs are creating drag in my glider and it is inefficient way of flying so it should be minimal barely what is required that input you're giving otherwise you're not giving so much input but again this will come with some practice initially you'll find yourself like giving a lot of input because you want to you know keep your glider steady and stable but with practice we want to reach a point where especially like you know if you see pilots uh, if, if it's a kind of a mature pilot a little expert uh, you'll hardly see him you know moving his controls because he, he can time it so well like before it's needed he gives a little fine timely input and you hardly see you know inputs being given and a lesser experienced pilot you'll see in a thermal you know trying to you know give too much input so you want to give minimal input but this will come with uh, you know practice so yeah questions uh, we can go to you know the uh, common mistakes yeah uh, so there is one small question most of our sites uh, at uh, kamshed where we do uh, mountain soaring yeah so where do we find thermals there because uh, as a low time pilots we are mostly at the mountains only there is no way we can get the thermals and learn all these tricks so, so we have to change the site or something or go to you know no 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 uh, like we said you know uh, November on it starts, you know, November, December, December, Jan, especially. Uh, there's proper thermaling happening at Tower Hill. Okay. 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 Uh, proper thermaling and proper thermals and uh, really good and a little bit more challenging, actually. Okay. Uh, and very good for practice. If you can, you know, practice in calm shed and get some sense of it. You go to beer and you say, oh, wow, I know thermaling, man, because they're much easier there. They are much more defined. They are bigger. They are less influenced by wind. So it's easier to thermal and practice thermaling in beer, for example. In Kamshit, uh, it's generally windy. So it's a okay. little bit more demanding. But still, you will see pilots thermaling. We are thermaling all the time, uh, uh, reaching the top and traveling a little bit. So 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 now that you have your wing and yeah. your timings of flying will also change you know like you'll probably be taking off at 10 o'clock for example uh you know in a little bit of turbulent conditions when there are thermal activity happening and uh, oh my god like fantastic uh, conditions in uh, kamshet uh, for thermaling no problem at all and even at pavna you know uh, we we thermal up at pavna then we go to Tikona and we've, you know, come down to Pirangut in Pune, like for example, uh, using both, you know, thermals and uh, uh, ridge lift, a combination of both. So, so yes, very much. Uh, for Pavna yep. season, you start taking a little early, uh, 2.33, 4 o'clock, you can easily practice thermaling. And in winters, uh, take off at 10.30 and beautifully you can practice. Yeah, thank you, sir. This time, not trying to miss any month in the coming year. And yes. Entire season, I want to capture now. This yes, <laughs> last yes. lot of it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Okay. So, first one, yeah, 
the timing for the takeoff. Uh, I would begin with. I would begin, you know, by saying that you know you're on the takeoff. Uh, if it looks flyable, just get ready. Uh, don't like you know, dilly dally and waste your time and checking and socializing, etc. You focus on your flying. You get ready, uh, and you're observing. You're observing. Uh, it's the same in beer as well. And if you see somebody uh, close to takeoff, rising, take off. Okay, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the best sign, and you go for it. Uh, and it's okay if you miss the thermal, you land, come back again. Uh, but uh, you know, like, uh, don't miss a chance to fly. So that's one. Secondly, uh, you want to observe the thermal cycles. You don't want to take off at a time when you know. Uh, <clears throat> so it can be happening that the cycles are having a big gap between them. You know, one cycle is coming, and then the next one is coming after like ten minutes or something. Oh my God! If you take off like at the wrong time and you get nothing, and if the takeoff is not very high, uh, you're surely going for landing. And one can say that you know, oh my God, it was a silly mistake. So you want to get ready. You want to observe. What's going on in the sky? What's happening at the takeoff? What kind of cycles are we getting? Are they regular? Uh, what is the kind of gap between uh, the two uh, cycles? How long are the cycles? And time your takeoff. Uh, so you want to take off at the beginning of a cycle so that you get the advantage, you know, of uh, gaining in that cycle, and you can easily make it to the house thermal, and you can start your game. Uh, so be sharp about this, be intelligent about this, and be clever about this. So first thing, uh, get ready. Uh, in places like Beard, you know, there are huge queues. There are 100 pilots, you know, 200 pilots on the takeoff. Uh, you want to be ready and you want to be, you know, uh, not miss out uh, the right time to take off. So if you're on takeoff and, you know, you see, you know, a guy is climbing in front of you, not very far from the takeoff, uh, what are you waiting for? You go for it. You get your cycle, take off, climb is right there, uh, gain your altitude, head to the house thermal, start your practice. So as you go further, uh, it's good to you know make a habit of this uh, to really you know uh, time your takeoff uh, really well. So so that's the first one. Any questions regarding this? It's uh, pretty simple and easy. A lot of people make mistake you know uh, on the on the takeoff. When you take off at the wrong time and then you know you glide down because it was a huge gap in the cycle. Uh, you found nothing on the way. Blah, blah, blah. Sad scene. Okay, in a, inadequate use of the outside brake. We you know talked about it. Uh, we'll talk uh, again about it. We'd like to show you a video. I think Sachin is in this video trying to show us like uh, uh, the use of the outside brake. So there he is. So he's in a right turn and you see the left hand and you can see that there's good usage of that brake. So the outside brake is uh, so important. You know, so like I mentioned before, you put your weight and you can keep the keep your weight pretty much there because you're not going to turn in the other direction now. So that weight, you just put it there, you keep it fixed. You know what kind of brake input you need, the inside brake for a 16 second or whatever. Uh, that kind of remains fixed as well. And now for all the corrections, you know, I, I use the outside brake. If my glider kind of yours, something makes it your, you know, I just, you know, put a little bit of brake. Or it's getting like too slow and it's getting choked a little bit. It's not moving, I ease up on the outside brake. So I control my speed with the outside brake, okay? I wanna go faster, I ease up on it. I wanna go a little tighter, I ease up on it. I'm going like too fast or diving too much, I apply a little bit of brake on the outside, okay? And a little bit of, you know, surges, yaws, things happening, these finer corrections is my outside brake. Inside is the solid brake, which is, you know, for opening and closing, controlling the bigger control of the turn. And outside brake is what I use for finer corrections. 
for my speed control and other you know tiny inputs connections small connections small finer subtle inputs i do it with the outside brake is that okay for the outside brake questions okay so uh, next one is turning too shallow or turning too tight again you know you will uh, really you know find yourself doing this it is very natural to do this in the beginning uh, especially if you not practice you know tight 360s and all you'll find yourself turning shallow and you'll keep seeing you know your outside uh, you know a tip folding and you know some collapses you'll get because you're on the edges you're flying on the edges there's more turbulence also and uh, some tips tucking in uh, will be pretty common. And in the beginning, you will find yourself uh, turning shallow. It's a very common mistake uh, in the beginning. Uh, or uh, you're giving in too much. You're giving in too much and it's not really needed. Uh, so uh, we need to know, like, you know like what is required at this particular situation or in this particular moment, actually. Uh, and to give, you know, the right bank angle, uh, right speed uh, is the art. To give the right bank angle and the right speed to the glider uh, to maximize the climb. Uh, and only through practice, you know, you'll reach this. And sometimes it will be so clear and so apparent that your glider has got a perfect bank angle and you're climbing beautifully and you feel, wow, this is the most amazing feeling, you know, like, you got the right bank angle, maybe you're hooked in into a nice, uh, nice uh, core, and you're beautifully climbing, and it's an amazing kind of sensation. And once you start getting it, you start to find, you know, your sweet spot, uh, and you start to know, you know, what is the best speed for my glider, what is the best angle, and your glider will tell you, like, wow, this is it, this is it, and you'll get these moments off and on, and you'll start to kind of uh, improve on this. So yeah, I mean, uh, it's a common mistake uh, to turn too shallow or too tight. And you will experience you're tucking in too much or you're turning so tight that you see, you know, pilots around you climbing and you're in a deeper bank angle, no, still not climbing as fast as them. Because uh, flatter the glider, uh, more the lift. Uh, so it's not that, you know, uh, if you turn tight, you'll get more climb. So you need to know like, what is the air doing and what is my optimum angle, you know, to kind of uh, get it right. Sometimes a uh, shallow angle is preferable, actually, if it's a big thermal and, uh, and there are many pilots and you can't really go to the core. A nice shallow angle is like giving you a really good climb. So that's that for turning too shallow or too tight. Uh, I'll move on, uh, changing the turn direction. Uh, I think for obvious reasons, we don't want to uh, use this as an option. Firstly, if we change you know, the direction in a thermal, our uh, mental mapping will go for a six. So we are trying to map, you know, create a little uh, idea of how this thermal in this particular situation is. And we do a thermal and the whole thing will go for a six. I'll not know, you know, where I was expecting the core to be in, and I lose the mental map if I change a direction like that. Secondly, the loss, the loss uh, can be quite a lot because you know, you're turning and the, you turn 90 and then you cover this 90 and then you do another 90. Uh, the change of direction is just 180 and you actually turn 270 degrees and uh, losing all this while. So, that is another reason that you don't want this to be, you know, the best choice. You rather continue and do a 270 and open the turn and you get back into the thermal in case you, know, you, you got out. But inside the thermal, the only reason that you want to change the direction is when, you know, like you're really like super sure, you know, like there's this seriously great climb, you know, uh, on the outside and then you switch. And there you hit a, a real ripper and you climb. I think it's the only way, like, otherwise you will confuse others. If the others flying, uh, you'll create some kind of a situation if you change direction like that. 
if somebody is approaching from outside, sees you changing direction, it'll confuse the guy as well. So you need to be aware of what's happening around you uh, before you, you know, take a decision like this of of changing changing your your turn direction. Uh, so yeah, be really uh, careful about this, uh, and it's not paying you much. Uh, it's actually uh, a decision which which will cost you. Uh, that should be clear. So next one is falling out of the thermal, uh, especially in the league. So initially we will, you know, naturally, you know, we'll be falling out of the thermal uh, when we are learning how to thermal. And even later, uh, you will see even uh, experienced pilots fall out of thermals. Maybe uh, a good pilot, an average good pilot gets 50% of the thermals. Uh, so I think uh, Satch has a video here to show you of Jadit. So there he is. And I think he got out for a bit and then got in again. So we see that so he's climbing, climbing, climbing in the thermal. Now he's shifting his circles, but there's not much of a climb. And now he's kind of out, out, and then he goes back into it. So he does a kind of a 180, continuous 270, and gets in again. So, so yeah, that's a that's a, that's an example. So, okay, so uh, you fall out, you do a 270, open the turn, get in again. Again, we talked about you know. Uh, we want to shift uh, our circles windward side. We talked about that uh, because you don't want to be falling in the lee because the losses are much more huge. There's more turbulence and getting back in uh, can be tricky. Uh, any questions? Uh, Avi, how difficult it is to uh, determine the radius of the uh, thermal? Uh, how easy or difficult it is to determine the you know radius of the thermal with well, practice? You know, yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. So with practice, you know, you'll start to get a hang of it. Hmm. But but uh, if there are other pilots, you know, flying with you, uh, it's pretty much easy because uh, you can pretty much know the you know radius of the uh, thermal okay. through and observation. Through observation, if yeah, you have okay, a glider okay. in front of you, and you know you suddenly see, boom, you know, it's outside your tip going like this. Okay, you should tighten yeah. your turn behind a little bit. Uh, you know exactly, you know that's the edge. Okay, okay, okay thank you. Yeah. And uh, uh, once you start thumbling, it becomes easy, especially when there are gliders around. It becomes really easy to figure out, you know, like how big or small it is. Okay, got it. Thanks. Uh, I must also mention that. Uh, uh, at lower altitudes, uh, generally they are very small, okay, and uh, and strong also. So at lower altitudes, you don't want to do gentle turns. You want to like you moment moment you you know hit some lift, you want to turn, and you want to turn like at a good angle uh, because you don't have a chance of searching and all that. You know, you're at low altitude. If you miss it, you're gone anyway. And in any case, uh, it is going to be narrow. Uh, and quite strong at, at, at lower level. As it goes up, it kind of becomes bigger and you know it's joined and the momentum kind of changes. So at lower levels, I hit it and I don't want to wait like, you know, I just hit the lift and I want to turn. Higher up, when you have altitude, okay, you can explore, you can go straight and, you know, wait and see, okay, you know, oh, wow, wow, wow. And when you feel I've got the best one, best climb now, and you begin your turn. So you have that option that when you have altitude. Lower down, we don't have. Okay, so uh, turning into sync uh, is kind of self-explanatory. And let's say, you know, like you, you lose a thermal. You want to do a gentle 360. And if you've got a rough idea of where the thermal is, you should hit the lift again, okay? But if you're sinking throughout, you don't want to do another 360 there. And you should 
kind of move towards, you know, if you see another source close by or a glider climbing or a better place. Otherwise, turning in sync, uh, you're just losing too much. So uh, maybe one, one, one search of a gentle 360 uh, should give you, put you back into the thermal again. So that's about turning in sync. And uh, yeah, you don't want to be doing that. Leaving the climb out, climb out of frustration. Uh, again, you know, it's, it's really common. But again, you know, it really, this part like really depends on, you know, your preparation. If you, you know, if you have a clear goal in your mind and uh, you're, you're giving yourself, you know, sufficient rest in between, uh, you will not uh, encounter this. But if you're trying too hard and you've got the wrong uh, kind of, you know, goals and uh, over expecting, you know, from yourself and maybe you're not dressed correctly and you're feeling cold and, uh, you know, whatever reasons can lead you to frustration uh, will lead you to taking, you know, the worst decisions and then, you know, uh, you want to run away from that. So, uh, recommendation is, you know, uh, you're going step by step. You got uh, uh, kind of reasonable goals to achieve. Uh, you're giving yourself sufficient rest in between the thermals. Uh, uh, you will not kind of land up in this. Uh, this is a mind which is uh, not really prepared very well and doesn't have clarity. Uh, yeah, but it can happen. It can happen. It can happen also. Yeah, too much. Uh, now I go out and land or something. So yeah, the best way is that, you know, uh, go step by step. Uh, please be more calm and relaxed. You need to bring yourself to the best uh, state to, 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 to not reach here. So that's about leaving the climate of frustration. Uh, I can't read the last one, Such. Uh, okay, so so yeah, I mean, uh, once you know we start to gain altitude, uh, we know that you know, especially you know, it's very very apparent in beer, for example, you know, you can reach uh, a certain altitude uh, in the house thermals, and if you don't now move towards you know higher terrain, uh, you cannot go higher. So it is possible that you know there is a kind of uh, a ceiling of the thermals at a certain level, and the house thermals are reaching just till here. You go to the next reach, only reaching till there. Uh, and you know, at the higher terrain, uh, the thermals are nice and strong and are able to go or penetrate this level and go much higher. So as you gain altitude, uh, we teach you to you know move towards higher terrain to go further up. So uh, again, you know, like uh, there are some people, you know, who just, you know, stay at this level and say, okay, you know, cloud base today was like really not so good. I could not travel too much. Uh, they go for landing and they hear that, you know, people went, you know, to Dharamsala and back. And uh, well, if you had just bothered to, you know, climb uh, the higher terrain, you could have gone much higher and it was much easier to travel. So, uh, again, a common mistake, just not knowing, you know, what to do next. Uh, no clarity in, you know, how to go further. So simple things like this. So, yeah, common mistakes. We can discuss more if you have any questions, any common mistakes. Any senior guys want to discuss as well. Any common mistakes comes to somebody's mind. Or any questions, or we can go ahead. Yes, Shabat. Uh, hi. Yeah, last last season in uh, Beer, I I think that was the first thermaling exposure. I would find myself tired with the weight shift after a while. Uh, so is there, is it because I was seated incorrectly, or is there a technique to build stamina? Because you know, I would keep feeling that uh, feeling uncomfortable in the weight shift. I was not not feeling comfortable in the weight shift. So I figured that I'm probably not sitting correctly or I'm trying 
initially I thought I was trying to raise the outside leg like we were taught in the school. Then I changed that and it got a little better, but I was still tired. Uh, I was still struggling with comfort. You know, I was not tired. I was just uncomfortable. I was like constantly trying to keep my weight. It wasn't, once I put it there, it didn't stay there. It would tend to come off. So is there a technique to build stamina and to be at ease in that kind of a posture? So uh, two, three points, you know, come to my mind. Uh, One is that you were not used to, you know, this kind of flying before. So it was, you know, uh, new muscles kind of getting engaged. You know, they're not used to supporting you like this. And you're asking them to support you now for longer duration. Mm -hmm. So so one is this. Uh, Second is uh, my weight shifting technique. So, so uh, like you said, you know, that leg thing is like, you know, old school. We don't use it in you know, school also anymore. Yeah. Uh, so it's just a movement in the hip uh, and, you know, uh, using the seat plate to, you know, use this. And I get more and more, you know, comfortable with this. So get in the simulator and see, uh, get your position right. I mean, check this with the instructor now. Uh, get the perfect, you know, setting of your harness. Because there is a position where, you know, a little bit has a more effect and you can be in a position where a lot of effort also is not, you know, helping you. So harness setting is second. And third is your style of weight shifting. You know, uh, what am I doing? Uh, what is, uh, what is, what can I do to get maximum result with minimum effort for my body? So you'll have to find that right. on a simulator and, you know, a little bit of line. Yeah. And uh, you will discover that very soon. And uh, when you shift to pod, like it kind of you know also becomes easier. And I don't think you're, you 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 have tried uh, using your stirrup, you know, if you have a stirrup, for example. So so you know, uh, very handy if you you know fix a stirrup uh, of the correct length, and that kind of gives you a leverage and makes it really easy for you to get shift without too much effort. You know, here you have to make effort, but the stirrup, you know, your legs, uh, just, you know, uh, adjustment there a little bit, you know, press more one side and your weight automatically comes without much effort, uh, you achieve weight shift. So these are two, three things that, you know, you can play with. Uh, Harness settings, your style of, you know, weight shifting, uh, stamina, of course, like it was your new first time thing, and then using a stirrup. And uh, like Rohit mentioned, you know, in the previous, uh, this thing, it also prepare you for your pod harness as well. And it'll give you ease and comfort as well. So that's what comes to my mind. Fine. Yeah. And the other thing, when you were saying, uh, don't continue turning in a sink. So mentally, what's your breakoff point? Because you will want to roll out and fly straight uh, towards your last point that you remember where you were getting anything or roll out into the wind and then come back again. Uh, see, see, if, if, if I have no clue, you know, yeah. where the wind is coming from and, you know, I have popped out and I'm in sync now, we are suggesting that, you know, you do uh, a 180 and a 270 and it'll, it has to get you back. Right. Okay. So, so from where you've come out, uh, you do a 270 and open the turn and you should get it. Uh, otherwise, if, uh, uh, if you, if you don't know where to go, then you have to, you should initially, like before getting out, you should have a few options already with you. Like you've seen two gliders climbing there, or you know, you know that the, the ground source for the house thermal is there. Or you know, the one spine, uh, two spine joining is right here. So as you get out and you do a 270 and you're not getting, your best option is this one uh, and you head there. So, so you don't want to like, you know, try there only, you know, you are in a sink in the whole 270, also in the 360, uh, you don't want to continue now. You rather move towards a better option because doing two 360s in sync, the loss is quite high. That's the idea. Yeah. Cool. This is a good one, uh, Shabbat, that, you know, you really need to be very high on your comfort level. Mm. Also, and I will also say, you know, like clothing, for example. Uh, not joking. Uh, if you are cold, if you are cold, it will make you tired. You know, it will make you tired, uh, and then you can get frustrated, and you know, you'll start to take those decisions. And you know, so you want to be really warm. You know, want to be really warm. 
uh, you want to have you know water available right here okay and uh, i used to struggle with my water pipe trying to suck you know and then uh, rohit you know came up with this pumpy thing which is quite fancy i just pump and the water comes very easily uh, so so you have to have comfort in your flight you don't want things bothering you etc so clothing and water to drink and of course like you know we've talked about how to keep relaxing yourself whenever you get an opportunity yeah. okay 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 so thermal traps risks and dangers so you know we talked about it a bit uh, thermally uh, you can make out by the terms you know prisoner effect and thermally uh, not very inspiring and uh, sounding great so i'll just show you uh, if you can give me the video again uh, such so for example you know like uh, let's say a strong strong thermal uh, really strong and creating like you know a lot of you know uh, turbulence and rotors in the lee and the wind is coming like this so uh, we were talking about you know keep moving upwind which will help you you know in your centering also and also um uh, the advantages of being uh, you know uh, in the upwind in case you fall out you still have advantages there but if you're falling out in the lee here then you know one is you're sinking second there's a lot of turbulence and third is if it's a strong thermal you're sinking and you're trying to go in and you're not, it is not letting you go in because you don't have speed also okay and so glider is not really flying uh, there's no loading on the glider as well in turbulence uh, you don't have a normal glider and then and then you just slide you know it doesn't allow you to get in and there's turbulence there is sink 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 so this is called the prisoner effect so falling in the lee not trying to, not able to get in and you're just going down 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 you just can't enter you just can't enter and you have to land now somewhere where it's not possible because the sink is really high so the way out is like you fly out uh fly out for a bit and then you know try and enter it from the side so that that's the only way well in time you know if you know that okay i'm aware that wind is like this i'm aware that i'm in the lee okay so let me get 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 out uh, come out of this and then you know i may be losing but fine i can easily enter from here so so that's that's a trap that we need to be really careful about and that's another advantage of moving up wind when you're thermally so i think some question some some chinese stuff what was it so abhi i have a question yeah okay now you just mentioned that you get to stuck on the leeward side then it's a yeah. problem for you to get inside the thermal again now yeah. the thermal also is basically flowing with the wind right so if you're on the leeward side i would imagine the thermal also is flowing down with the wind and uh, so why is it so difficult to get back into the thermal again so you know i'll give you an example that it's a strong thermal correct so stronger the thermal less will be the effect of the wind on it ah uh, it's acting like a wall now okay 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 yeah, now yeah, i understand yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like a tree now Un okay. understood now i got it okay yeah. got it thanks cool so we go ahead okay so so that's one second uh, i think stall spin and collapse okay so you know you'll be surprised you know like uh, so many example and it's a common thing you know people stalling especially spinning and even you know collapses in thermals so you know as uh, you know flying is evolving and uh, uh, collapses are like you know like you really you know need to work on your skills if you're getting uh, collapses people don't get collapses anymore uh, with the kind of skills and also with the kind of gliders we have nowadays with shark nose coming in and uh, with you know uh, ribs coming in reinforcements coming in gliders are becoming more and more you know hard to collapse okay and if you're getting collapses 
uh, you need to really really work on your you know active piloting skills uh, generally average above average uh, pilots uh, don't get collapses unless you know you're flying in the wrong place you're flying in a lee or you're flying in a very turbulent air etc uh, so so this is about the collapses uh, you can get like if if your part of your wing goes out and you know you get a little a small uh, tip fold otherwise uh, you need to really work on your active piloting skills and generally you will see you know you're you're not getting collapses you can check with you know senior club pilots here you know when did they get their last collapse uh, you'll generally not hear it uh, so not happening before the lot. lockdown before the lockdown so but stall and spin you know like really common i myself have seen like you know so many pilots spinning you know in the in the uh, thermal why because they they put on the brakes um, they put on the brakes they want to maximize optimize you know the climb and uh, now they you know want to you know uh, give it an extra little bit of input they don't know their uh, stall point and they spin the glide uh, pilots uh, also are not aware like i mentioned before that uh, the spin point depends on your wing loading Uh, it doesn't depend on how much brake you applied so uh, i think there's a video which we saw last time you know there was a uh, a line of trees and this guy was you know in kind of turbulent air behind the trees and he didn't have, he hadn't applied too much brake you know uh, on the right side and the glider spun because probably the loading is very poor and the glider will spin very early and also people are not aware like how much brake they apply and they don't know the spin point and they just you know want to turn tight they apply the brake and boom the glider is in a spin sometimes you know uh, they see somebody coming close uh, they don't know their spin point they apply a little bit of brake bang they go into spin very common okay uh, glider spinning uh, you know in thermals a uh, common thing to see <clears throat> we have a video here just notice you know the brake position uh, how this guy you know spins the glider and stalls also Uh, see how he's flying you know from how he's holding the brakes you can come to know you know the level of the pilot and there it goes see the brake position still see the brake position there the glider dives from a spin he goes to a full stall see the brake position this back fly position perfect back fly very nice and then okay did it make sense do you want to see it again okay observe the brake uh, position a lot of brake here yeah? i don't know why there's a lot of brake like carabiners that's too much of brakes and he he turned and spun to the right there he still full brakes on and thankfully he's gone into back fly then he's released the glider's dived and yeah okay abhi i don't think he uh, corrected it by going into back fly he was just holding the brake still at the same level and it and he stalled and it happened to be in back fly and he, he, he got yeah, saved yeah it was uh, by yeah, default yeah by by default he was in back fly yeah and he kept the brakes on to, even after spin at the stall same level yes yes good, yes good, yes good idea actually <laughs> <laughs> stay in back fly okay i think pratik had a question <clears throat> okay so uh, quickly like you know if you are in turbulence and uh, the glider is not as well loaded as it as it normally is okay and uh, for example you know if you remember the previous video the glider was you know pitched back there's a little high angle of attack it was not in smooth air flow loading has changed of the glider and now if you apply a brake you know if you were to stall at this point uh, maybe you'll stall early okay because uh, it, it, it's not the normal flying characteristics of the glider okay yeah 
so uh, you need to be extra careful uh, when you're in turbulence, for example, uh, same things don't apply. Uh, and when you're thermaling at, you know, a lot of brake pressure, a uh, little bit more and, and, and you go to a spin. So that is why, you know, we were talking about, you know, pre thermaling requirements. You need to know your stall point. You need to know your spill, spin point. Okay. And if you're experienced, you'll know by the feel only like, you know, uh, oh, there's, there's nothing now. Don't continue. It'll go. The feeling, uh, you'll not have the feeling also. It will not that because of poor wing loading, it will surprise you. You'll still know, you know, that, okay, this is not a normal feeling. Why do I want to continue? If I continue, pung, it goes. Okay. Fine. So common mistake, you know, uh, stalling and spinning the glider uh, in the thermals. Traffic, gaggle flying, collision. We have uh, another video, but I will just talk about uh, a few things about uh, traffic and uh, gaggle flying. So first is, I hope you know, like all of you have read, you know, the thermaling uh, rules, uh, thermaling etiquettes, how to join a thermal, uh, how to uh, stay in a thermal and how to exit a thermal. Uh, I hope everyone knows about these rules. We can't, you know, go over the rules now, but basically, uh, uh, you have to join from the outside, okay? Uh, basically not disturbing anybody, not coming in anybody's way, uh, and you always join the thermal from the outside, seeing the uh, back of the helmet of the guy in front of you uh, in the thermal. If you see, you know, a gaggle where, you know, pilots are, you know, flying in different directions, uh, which way you want to turn? So you, whatever level you are, and whatever is the turn direction at your level, uh, that's the direction you follow. If uh, there are pilots, you know, at high level following some other direction. So you are more concerned about your level and you follow that direction. Uh, and secondly, uh, thirdly, uh, don't do, you know, jerky movements. Don't do, you know, sudden movements uh, that surprise, you know, other pilots in the gaggle, in the thermal. Uh, because uh, uh, nobody wants to be surprised. And then they will have to get for you of you and they, you, you scared maybe some people and disturbed, you know, they're flying by doing that. So you need to fly predictably uh, where uh, people feel comfortable around you. Uh, uh, in, in a gaggle, uh, the, the, the core is uh, foregone by everybody and everybody actually uh, shares the thermal and fly flies in in weaker weaker uh, uh, part of the thermal just because uh, that's the best way to share the thermal and you need to respect that uh, you can't be cutting corners and you know suddenly coming in the center you can but you need to be really good and you should know what you're doing that okay i am going to cut in because it's very clear to me that i'm going to outclimb the guy in front and behind I'm not disturbing anyone in any way. I can do that. And you need to be really good and sure about that. Otherwise, uh, you create you know, situations where you put uh, not only your life uh, in jeopardy, but other pilots who you know, don't deserve uh, this from you. So uh, yeah, uh, we can see a video here. Uh, you need to you know, practice flying in traffic I need to have a bit of thermaling uh, proficiency to fly in a gaggle because a lot is demanded. Uh, you not only you know need to fly your glider really smoothly. Uh, you can't be you know looking at your instruments. Uh, you need to really know uh, what's happening around you and making those small adjustments for others to to make it uh, you know safe for others. Because you'll be surprised you know like if you're flying at you know 10 meters per second. Um, uh, 50 meters is a huge, 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 you know, distance. And if two gliders are approaching, you know, uh, each other head on, it'll take like two, three seconds before you are, you know, colliding. You'll not even know because the approach speeds adding both uh, are really fast. And within like, you know, five seconds, you are like hitting somebody. Uh, you need to be like seriously aware of this uh, before you start uh, gaggle flying. You need to have a certain proficiency level. 
uh, airmanship level, awareness level to fly in a gaggle. Uh, and don't expect like, you know, like everybody is like top notch in the thermals. There might be some idiots there. Uh, you not only have to fly really well, uh, carefully, uh, not making mistakes and not disturbing others, but even, you know, watch out for idiots because some people will just come and fly through a thermal. Uh, you'll see somebody just coming at you, you know, like uh, you need to know, you know, what to do. And that is why, you know, I recommend, you know, like, I don't know why you should be flying without an SIV. Uh, you just yank your brake, you know, like you can yank your brake full and release. And within no time you're diving and your direction has changed 180 degrees without any collapse or any spin. Uh, but you need to have practice in this you know, to avoid a collision, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a thermal, which is crowded. So uh, we'll slowly, you know, like to have a look at this uh, particular video where you see uh, how people have a mid-air collision. Avi, you are muted. Okay, watch out for the orange glider. See his, uh, you know, flight path. See the flight path of the gradient, which uh, is the POV for us, and the red glider. So this guy has, you know, cut the turn. Okay, he's, he's turned inside. So watch this. Now this guy is uh, moving too fast, such. Okay. Now they hit each other. Uh, look at that. The approach speeds are really fast and you wouldn't know also, you know, like it happens so fast. And look at that now. You're supposed to deploy your reserve like if you have a mid-air, you don't even, Think just for a second, if it doesn't untangle in a second or two, you throw. And, you know, pilots are shouting, you know, throw reserve, throw reserve. Finally, it throws the reserve. There you are. Landed. So trees are like beautiful things, you know, for paragliding pilots. They have saved so many lives, trees. Yeah, like, you know, just one more month, like, you know, you always, you know, clear your turn, but just once you didn't and you hit somebody. Um, I mean, this is a sport like that, you know, like really challenges us and uh, we need to be really good with our stuff. Uh, once you don't look and it can, you know, give a situation like this. Okay. Okay. So we quickly cover the points uh, for understanding the clouds. Okay. You know, we will, uh, we're, we're getting into... Hey, yeah. Hey, Avi. Uh, I think you showed the video, uh, yeah. but it might be a good idea to talk a little bit more. I know it's, it might be digressing, so maybe we can do later in an incident session. But I think there were some very interesting uh, observations about this particular incident. So what um, one pilot should have done, pilot number two should have done, pilot number three should have done. Uh, so do you think it's a separate later or... Uh, up to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, we'll have to do it separately because uh, okay. uh, I think we can use this video in our uh, incidents and accidents uh, series uh, sure. because it'll take it'll take time. You know, here That's we just right. want to show you know what can happen. You know, somebody, yeah, yeah. So somebody can just come in, and if you're not watching out, and the importance of you know being good, you know, in gaggle flying. But yeah, I mean, uh, we can uh, save this one. Cool. cool. So. Uh, Understanding of clouds, you know, like uh, I'll quickly cover some points. Basically, uh, 
you know, the shape, the size of the clouds gives you a very good idea of, you know, thermals. Um, uh, if it's like a clearly defined base and, you know, clearly defined, you know, top triangle shape, you can be sure, you know, that there's a nice thermal there. And uh, if it's a big base uh, and uh, if it's a, uh, if it's dark, the darkest part, part of the cloud, you know, on the base will have uh, the strongest climb. And if it's a dome base, uh, you can be sure that it's a very strong kind of a thermal. Uh, all clouds are, uh, will not have a thermal under them. You need, really need to know like, you know, the life cycle of the cloud, whether it's building, whether it's, you know, reach its peak or whether it's, you know, diffusing and dying. So don't expect that, you know, you see a cloud, you go below, uh, you'll get a lift. Uh, on a good day, like uh, one out of three will give you a, a climb maybe. So we need to uh, understand, you know, the clouds uh, really well. That comes with experience and study. Uh, also, you know, like if you if you don't know uh, that this, the lift gets really smooth under a cloud and uh, if you can't judge, you know, your altitude, suddenly, you know, uh, you are in whiteout. Suddenly you're inside and you don't know what, what to do. Uh, it can be disorientating. Uh, if there are two guys in a cloud, you know, there's a good chance of, you know, getting a midair without even knowing it. If the cloud is, you know, close to the terrain, uh, you don't know which side you will exit, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope you've read, you know, uh, this book by Kelly, you know, there's a good, interesting 45 uh, uh, degree rule uh, that kind of, you know, uh, helps you escape. So if the base is like, let us say, uh, 500 meter length, uh, uh, 500, uh, half of that below, you should start heading out and it will keep you safe. So we will cover, you know, clouds more in our weather series, but uh, when you are high, you can look at clouds and it can be a big help, but not when you're low. When you're low, you want to look at, you know, ground features, ground, ground sources. Uh, only when you're high, you want to look at clouds for clues. So that's about the clouds. Just uh, a brief uh, touch upon that. Then uh, dizzy, feeling dizzy, disoriented, feeling like throwing up. Uh, these, this, this can happen uh, when you're beginning. And we've had, you know, some students, you know, experiencing this. The moment you encounter something like this, uh, please don't push it. You're taking like, you know, the risk, risk level is going really high if you push it when you're not, you know, physically feeling good. You're feeling even a little bit dizzy, you're feeling even a little bit disoriented or the signs of, you know, symptoms of feeling a little off, uh, feeling a little pukey, uh, you know, just, just head out and uh, go for landing. Uh, you're, you're taking the risk to a high level uh, and increasing the danger if you, if you decide to push and, you know, continue to fly. So that's it for this particular slide. We can go to the next slide. Okay, understanding the weather. So, uh, you know, uh, I think we will cover, you know, a lot in our uh, series on, uh, you know, uh, the weather, but uh, you better, you know, do, some kind of forecasting before you, you know, go into the sky. Better idea of, uh, better idea you have of what's happening in the sky today, um, better are your chances of, you know, uh, flying really well. So uh, please check not just one model, uh, but check like, you know, several models uh, to give you a, you know, better, fairer idea, you know, of what's happening in the sky and not just one website. Uh, so GFS model is one, uh, Meteor Blue is another. They use uh, uh, NEMS uh, model. Uh, one is, you know, a uh, little rough. GFS is quite rough because the, the area they take is, you know, quite quite big, but it is more reliable. And the Meteor is more precise, but not always so good. So you need to check both or maybe a third one and see, you know, uh, that uh, if they're converging or not. Uh, and if they are not converging, then also see like which one works for that particular uh, flying site. Like we were in Dehradun and we realized, you know, Meteor Blue was working really well there. 
and it can you know differ if you are planning to you know go you know to fly on the weekend uh, start seeing you know what's happening on monday tuesday wednesday uh, see how reliable it is how much you know changes are happening and that will help you you know to forecast uh, when it comes for time to fly uh, whether uh, how good it is so uh, don't just check one but check several uh, check you know with the people from that area like which particular one works the best for that particular area uh, first you know like check uh, global weather uh, see what are the movements uh, then come to you know uh, uh, local flying and then use your forecasting depending on your understanding of uh, the terrain so so yeah uh, once you reach a level of you know studying weather sounding you are in a very good place to really forecast for yourself and if you you know start uh, you know using this uh, using these tools and you realize you know you become really good at it you look at it and you know what happened you know last two days and you're in a very good place to forecast uh, which takeoff we should go what time we should fly and all this will help you in a big way to maximize you know the day observe how the day is evolving and identify which model is working best for a particular site so yeah i just mentioned that okay okay the final uh, you know slide uh, we mentioned a few things uh, uh, please make it easy for you you know uh, because you're doing a challenging sport uh, there are enough challenges you want to reduce and you want the mind you know to be uh, free to to respond to the challenges that uh, are unknown you know as yet so you want to be you know totally like you know uh, uh, like a serial killer you know like totally thoroughly prepared with every little thing you know uh, your gear your your things are, your things are charged uh, your equipment nicely folded you know properly set uh, your helmet your you know stuff everything is there uh, it shouldn't be like you know go on take off and you see like oh my god like you know or, oh shit you know do you have an extra this or that or you know uh, i mean come on you know like you don't add, add to your stress so you want to sort that out you know a day prior you want everything in place uh, i mentioned about dressing up for cloud base you know have no doubt you don't want to be shivering up there it's amazing you know beautiful view you could do so much but you didn't dress up and you thought you know it's like so hot and now you have to go down or your hands are numb and uh, you're increasing the you know the risk factor so make sure you know you get good clothing you want to be comfortable and always dress up for cloud base that's that's a rule um gloves and shades uh, goes without saying saying you know like have the best gloves uh, all the gloves will not work you know when you go high altitude so you need special gloves and maybe heaters if if you're staying up you know longer in the air uh, you learn all this for people who have like you no know, little eyesight thingy there are shades that have uh, partly you know power and you can read your instruments uh, and have shades so this is available I, I can help you with that beeper gps mobile this should be really sorted the day before charged everything is in place your cockpit is you know all instruments are secure they're in the place uh, goes without saying uh, again proper shoes because uh, without saying uh, patience perseverance and ability to learn from failures uh, of course i mean uh, paraglide nothing has taught me you know patience more than paragliding and it's also taught me to persevere try 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 and we will fail you know like it's beautiful like to fail uh, to try and to fail <laughs> to try and to fail and uh, and you build a perseverance and you take it as a play you know nothing teaches you about life as much as flying does you didn't take it too seriously i mean you take it as a play you're playing uh, and getting better uh, you you never lose you either win or you learn uh, you never lose in flying you're either winning whatever goal you had whatever you try or you're learning so it's a win win all the time um so so that's about patience i mean patience uh, 
it's a beautiful quality to have mm-hmm. in, in relationships in uh, you know anywhere and everywhere uh, you are a notch above if you have patience in a, any situation you can stay calm and you know uh, rule the situation so uh last point like fitness uh you know uh, i am learning this i never used to exercise before but now you know like i need to exercise uh, it's very clear uh, when i have to climb with the you know glider and you know start to like pant and all you realize you know that uh, you're not as fit as before so fitness uh, will help you becoming a better pilot uh, so spend some time you know exercising you need core muscles you need upper body strength at least these two please work on it and if you can run and you know more fit you are uh, no doubt you know better pilot you are uh, it goes a long way uh, fitness uh, stamina uh, you can slowly build it up uh, it takes a little while in flying for an hour or two hours and three hours or four hours and five hours and uh, there's a way of doing it uh so so yeah uh, what was the last point sir uh fitness stamina and uh, yeah okay last duration sir yeah yeah cool 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 so i i i really, i covered that thank you we can remove this slide so 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 yeah that's 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 about it and uh, just something came to my mind you know like when you're when you're thermaling um uh, somebody is higher than you well okay challenge you know like uh, how come he's there or she is there you know so if he or she can be there there's something i need to do better so so enjoy like you know uh, taking up this challenge and you know if, if somebody else can be there i can be there too it's just a matter of skill so it's a beautiful little you know, childish kind of a challenge okay i want to get there i want to be on top i don't want like you know uh, anyone you know to see you know the top surface of my wing okay they only see the under surface of my wing that is my goal so i make sure that they only see the under surface nobody sees the top surface of my wing so you give these little challenges and enjoy that okay i'm going to get you i'm going to go up i'm going to get you you know uh, make it fun make it fun and okay okay maybe tomorrow no problem thank you very much you taught me a lot every pilot in the sky is teaching you Uh, not only teaching you giving you very valuable information it's a beautiful thing you thank everyone in the sky and uh, well, thank you for challenging me and you know telling me that i can do better oh wow so this is a fun game and uh, yeah so so that's it uh, any questions i think we've again exceeded the time uh, i can take a few questions if there are uh, Yes sir uh, i had uh, one question regarding uh, the topic of uh, sync so my question uh, is that uh, um, without the instrument uh, is there a significant feel uh, when we are in the sync column uh, because uh, I, as a beginner i am not able to differentiate between the natural uh, descent rate of the glider and uh, sync so uh... first is that in the beginning we you know when you start to thermal we like you to you know get an instrument uh because our body uh can feel the changes so when my glider is flying and it gets pulled up in lift and there's a change i can feel the sensation in my body okay and if i am you know flying in lift and suddenly i start to sink that also you will feel that yes i sank just now so you can sense the changes but once you are established in a climb or you are established in a sink that that sensation and feeling will go away okay then we come to references so the terrain will easily tell me if there's there's a mountain if i'm turning and i look oh i am climbing i'll be easily able to say uh, with respect to the terrain whether i'm climbing or i'm sinking so but if there's no terrain close to me then i do need an instrument to tell me if i'm continuously in a sink or i'm continuously in a climb did okay. did i answer you did yes, i answer yes. you understood yes yes yeah but when we start thermaling we recommend that you know you have an instrument use okay. it use it use it okay put it off again 
and then fly without it, uh, develop your senses, and then use it again and just play with it like this. Yeah, we have just going. Can I ask a question here? Yes, please. Shant, okay. So I was just going through whatever people have asked uh, and the chats now. Now, the first question which Kaiser asked, gliders like ENA are a bit slow to achieve faster turns though. Now, in terms of performance, see, I haven't flown anything beyond ENA. Like the okay. fastest take I flew was the Magic. Now, I would think that ENA and these basic gliders have a lot of stability built into them. And they're more resistant to any maneuver. And uh, you would know better because you would have flown all sorts of gliders across the entire uh, port portfolio. Yeah. Do you think it's be also because ENA have a lot of stability built in them and they are slightly resist? They, they, they resist that, tended, that thing to make a turn compared to your ENBs and ENCs, which are, because of the aerofoil section, they, they turn very quickly. They're, Built with certain amount of instability in them also. Do you think it could that could be a reason? You know, the difference is uh, not really too much. Okay. Okay. I mean, uh, you can, you know, take an ENA glider and thermal and do 100 kilometers. No problem. You can thermal really well. You can do, you know, wing overs. You can do, you know, helico. Uh, you can do anything on an ENA. Okay. So, right. so, so you can just, you know, free yourself from this. Okay. Uh, there, there's, there's a graded difference, you know, between A's, B's, C, mm -hmm. D's, and yeah, it's a very graded difference. Okay, all right. It's not, not like large. I mean, if you're in A, you're not greatly different from B's. Okay. Okay. And the, the new generation gliders, like the, the concept of A plus now, I mean, they're better than like uh, maybe B's of uh, you know three years back. Yeah, I remember. I think the magic is A plus. Yeah. So, so an A plus magic today hmm. is better than epsilon, for example, which is a B. Oh, okay. You oh. know, which uh, three years back, epsilon five or six, for example. So the new generation A plus is B is you know, you can just clear it from your head. Uh, no, like really greatly visible difference that you can't thermal or you can't turn or nothing like that. Got it. Understood. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, special episode this Sunday. We're getting uh, a very special guy from uh, Nova who's uh, going to talk to us about, you know, designing, manufacturing, evolution in designs, and, you know, some interesting stuff. We it's just a short uh, uh, session, just one hour. Uh, be ready with your questions, and I think a lot to learn about you know uh, glider development. And uh, so that's what we're doing on uh, Sunday. And from next week, on popular demand, we get into weather. So you know, flying weather episode one. I think we bring on Sachin uh, Wednesday next week, and. Uh, yeah, we keep uh, entertaining you. And yeah, thank you for the poll. If you've not participated in the poll, 